hello hello welcome back to another section of boy erased memoir by gerard conley um i'm hoping that the noise from my neighbors does not disrupt us too much tonight um but yeah i'm really enjoying this one so far um i did some put some uh content warnings in the last section if things come about again that um i feel should have like a content warning i will put that in the description um, so just be forewarned about that. But yeah, I hope you have been enjoying this one as we've been reading along. Um, we are on page 125. And yeah, if you're liking it, give it a like. And if you want to catch the rest of the book with us, subscribe. So let's jump right in. Page 125 at the bottom, there's a little page break. I was waiting for a sign from God as David tapped his feet beside me in the church. I tapped back. One, two, three. We let our feet dance around each other. The youth pastor positioned himself behind the pulpit. As Christians, he said, we must put on the armor of God. His words came at the end of a euphoric song worship. A few of the congregants' final notes carried over into his sermon, spiraling through the reading of scripture. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, and ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And the girl beside be moaned and spoke in tongues, her hands pressed up against some invisible, something invisible in the air before her, her voice filled with unfamiliar syllables and ululation. The youth pastor paused for a moment, his eyes flashing over each member of the congregation. Stand, therefore, having your loins girthed over, about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Arming oneself for the Pentecostals seemed as simple as raising your hands in the air to receive the fruits of God's armory. The Holy Spirit would then fasten on you the breastplate of righteousness. Place the shield of truth in your fist like some medieval page. Sitting beside me, David seemed as if he might already be wearing his invisible armor. He mumbled the syllables of a secret language to himself, one that his enemies would never be able to interpret. No need for evolution, this language seemed to say. Our God will keep you safe from your enemies, help you sleep at night. On the issue, the Baptists and the Pentecostals agreed. Christians had to arm themselves against Satan's offensive against our country. I had re recently heard Baptist pastors like Jerry Falwell condemning in militaristic terms our country's effeminacy, blaming terrorism against America on homosexuality, on the permissiveness of our culture. Brother Nielsen and, and his make em all philosophy have proclaimed more or less the same. Foreigners would have no WMDs, the logic went, if we hadn't gone so soft. I had heard it in our own church when a bald, red-faced red man burst into my Sunday school class carrying a church petition that asked us to stand against the LGBT pride parade taking place just hours from our town. Sign it, the man had said, or else how can you call yourself a soldier in the Christian army? The paper passed from person to person until it came to me, until I felt everyone staring at me while I held the pen before the paper, afraid to sign as though I would be drafted into some real-life army the minute I added my name, until I finally formed the letters of my name, hating its ability to fit so clearly and easily within the petition's dotted lines. But now the youth pastor was telling me that I could be strong just by accepting God's gifts. I could enter into David's secret language, feel the weight of those syllables rolling off my own tongue, our separate bodies unified through one body of Christ. In one blinding flash, the promise of such intimacy became everything for me. I might find my real inspiration there. During the second year of their marriage, when my father and mother still shared a bedroom, a singular encounter tested their faith in God's divine protection. My mother was sleeping beside my father, the television off, the room dark, the house quiet, when one of the cotton gin employees crept into the bedroom, knife in hand, and crawled onto the cool sheets, like a man who turned the key and burned my father's face and hands, this man's motivations would never be clear to any of us. He moved close to my mother and grasped one of her legs, ran his hands up her thighs, 
and with his knife-wielding hand held the blade to her neck, kept her hostage, stopped her from crying out. The man had assumed my father was gone. My father's pickup truck wasn't parked out front, but this was only because he had, for reasons he could never explain, decided to park around the back of the house. The employee had not been thorough, his desire too strong to allow a slow approach. As the man slid up the bed toward my mother, my father was retrieving his shotgun from under the bed, preparing to shoot him. I couldn't really see him in the dark, my mother would later say, but I could hear the click of the gun safety. That was very clear. My mother sat up as the man's cold, rough hands fell against her skin. How did he not feel my father lying there next to her? This detail, like so many others, would remain a mystery. My father found the shotgun, and, in the darkness, before he could adjust his eyes, he aimed the twin barrels at the space where he thought he could make out the man's silhouette, mistaking the back of my mother's head for this man's. My mother was directly in the line of fire. Once the man heard the click of the safety, he leaped from the bed, and my father chased him through the house until the man was able to escape out the back door and disappear somewhere in the cotton fields. Though my father had been able to identify the intruder, he was never able to offer up any clear proof to the authorities, and my parents' only option was to fire the man immediately and place a restraining order against him. The one other time my father met his former employee in town, my father said, Come anywhere near my wife again, and I won't just kill you. I'll torture you the way you intended to torture her. My mother found it impossible to sleep after this incident, Blaming her insomnia on my father's snoring, she left the television going all night. She would take my top bunk when she couldn't sleep, and I would hear her breathing slow within minutes of entering the sheets. When the two of us slept in the same room, the world outside seemed to recede, our fears along with it. We felt safe. My bunk mate, she would say. Love, I would say back. My father never seemed to forgive himself for accidentally placing the twin barrels of the shotgun to the back of my mother's head. Raised to see himself as the protector of the family, the head of the household, he felt that he had failed to do his job. He had already failed with the first baby, had been unable to cure whatever complications had lain dormant in my mother's body. If he ever had a chance at another child, he promised himself he would never again let harm come to his family. But he could never predict what would come to all of us once I left his house. A few hours after the church service, I was in David's room, and he was dipping his index and middle fingers into a can of motor oil. We have to protect ourselves from sin, he said. He walked to the dorm window, stood on a chair, and smeared the oil in a line above the metal casing. We have to cleanse this room of demonic forces. He began to speak in tongues, which sounded like a faux African dialect mixed with long English vowels. He was wearing the outfit I had grown so fond of in the past few months when I had seen him in the dorm. That's enough, I said, laughing. I sat on the topmost rung of the bunk ladder. Stop it. I loved him in that moment. I loved the way his leg hair snaked in a lowercase j that stretched from the back of his knee to the elastic band at the bottom of his briefs. Maybe it's not the best, he said, stepping down from the chair, but it works. The youth pastor had run out of anointing oil at the church. You'll just have to use this, he'd said leading David and me out of the old post office to the back of his car, popping his trunk and removing a one-quart yellow Pennzoil bottle. He invited several of the congregants to pray over this bottle, to bless it with God's anointing power. Thank you so much, David had said. This is a lifesaver. David dipped his fingers into the bottle again. He skipped around the room, playfully cocking his head at various angles, trying to decide what to anoint next. Hmm, he said, I don't know. You're ridiculous, I said. You don't expect me to believe this, do you? He walked over to me, looping his free arm through the rung where my bare feet were resting. He reached up with his other hand and placed his oil-covered fingers in front of my leaning forehead. Don't you dare, I said. Ow, demon, he shouted, half serious now, flinging black back his hand. A drop of motor oil landed on the frozen avalanche of bed sheets that fell from the top bunk where I had flung them earlier. Press the oil to my forehead, using his thumb to blend it into my skin. A few hours passed, and then it happened. At first, it was like baptism. I felt my body go under, but someone else's hands urged me below the surface. Like my baptism, I had worried what it would feel like, what I would be asked to do, 
the exact logistics of the act. Would I feel differently? Would I be changed forever, as people said I would? I worried about how my body would look. I worried about the stretch marks. Even as he forced my head down, I worried that I might not do it right. Even as I gagged and struggled, pulled at the hairs on his calves, trying to do anything that would make him stop, I worried about upsetting him. This was not what I wanted it to be, I thought. Okay, I thought this before. At the age of 12, standing inside the baptistry of our family church, I had clutched at the gown that clung to the fat rolls along the waist, my waistline as the congregation looked on and clapped. I was a new man standing on new territory, born again in Christ's image. Members of my church family shouted, Amen! I looked out at their faces, feeling as though I had stripped off all my clothes and revealed the most vulnerable part of myself. I was no longer invisible. Please take a moment if you need to. That is really, really heavy stuff. Okay, let's keep going. Page 132 at the page break. Everything else that led to my enrollment in Love and Action felt like a deserved punishment. David confessed the same night that he raped me that he had also recently raped a 14-year-old boy in his youth group, that he didn't know why he did it, couldn't explain it. I had been unable to move from the bed where he had placed me afterward. I believed that God was punishing me physically for my mental transgressions. Somehow the demons had entered this room despite our charms against them. I wanted to be a youth pastor, he said, sobbing so loudly the neighbors pounded on the other side of his concrete block wall. How can I be a youth pastor now, after what I've done? I didn't yet recognize it, but the logic of ex-gay therapy, the, law, the, ideal, the idea that my sinful urges were somehow equal to David's, began to invade my thoughts. Of course, I was sitting on the same bed as a pedophile, according to scripture. I was no better than a pedophile, or an idol worshiper, or a murderer. When I told the Presbyterian pastor at our college what David had done to the 14-year-old boy, she told me to stay quiet, that I had no real evidence, that it was a bad thing, yet there was nothing to be done. I believed my silence was due punishment. I didn't tell her about what he had done to me, in part because I suspected that rape and shame was what gay sex was all about, but mostly because I was too embarrassed to admit that I hadn't been strong enough to fend him off and I was worried that she would interrupt or interpret this weakness as a submission to homosexuality. Okay, I said, reading the leather-bound spines that circled her office shelves, wondering if these theologians, too, had found a way to dodge such difficult issues. If life was ever going to make sense again, I would have to search harder for clear answers. David called my mother a few weeks later out of his own desperate guilt and told her that her only son was a homosexual, a gay. He's disgusting, he said to her, a monster. I found out from a mutual friend that my mother was on her way to the college to take me back home, and I sat in my friend's dorm room quietly sobbing into a plush pillow while she patted my back. According to a friend who learned it from David, my mother had said over the phone that my father wasn't going to continue paying for my education if I was going to be openly gay. I turned off my cell phone, hoping I could block out what was coming to me. My mother drove to the college that night and asked me to come home to talk to my father. She brought another woman from church with her because she was afraid to face me alone. The other woman waited in the car, her eyes avoiding mine, as my mother and I sat on a bench just outside the quad. My mother asked me, in a voice quieter than I'd ever heard her speak, if what she had heard was true. No, I said at first. David's a liar. A minute of silence passed. Then, feeling I could no longer keep it inside, I burst into tears and told her it was true, that I was gay. Saying the word aloud made me feel sick inside, and I wondered if what David had forced me to swallow 
had somehow grown inside of me, rendered me permanently gay. Embarrassed, my mother led me to the car. The other woman didn't say a word. As I lay in the back seat, quietly sobbing, watching the high line wires move across the stars, I thought, what else could have come from this? The moment I'd stepped away from the shower, the PlayStation soaking in the tub behind me, I'd taken on an independent life. I'd taken on too much at once, and I'd gagged on the freedom of it. Later that night, when my father said, you'll never step foot in this house again if you act on your feelings, you'll never finish your education, I thought, fair enough. I looked up at the gilded picture frames covering our living room wall, wall at all the smiling faces of our family members looking down at me from happier vantage points at Ann Ellen when she was beautiful and oblivious. And I thought, anything, I'll do anything to erase this part of me. Whew. Page 137. Friday, June 11th, 2004. Wake up, shower, eat breakfast, travel, arrive at office. By the third moral inventory, by the fifth day of therapy, I had already revealed to my LIA group what I felt were all of my carnal sins, though I never actually told them what David had done to me, too afraid God would punish me further if I revealed the secret. I felt hollowed out, certainly not cured, but no longer filled with the sins I'd kept secret for so long. Yet rather than feeling relieved, I felt, what exactly? My guilt and fear had all but disappeared in only a matter of days, replaced by what I could only describe as nothing. It was nothing that led me through the facility's white hallways. It was nothing that brought the fork to my mouth during lunch breaks. Nothing steadied my voice as I read aloud my list of sins before the group. And it was nothing that sent me to the bathroom to stare into the mirror at the gaunt, hollow-eyed face of a boy who, only a week before, I would have considered on the verge of some vague, awful business. It was the face of a newly minted addict, a stranger you might see on the city sidewalk, carrying his childhood stereo to the pawn shop, rainbow Lisa Frank stickers still curling around the edges, but rather than the soiled t-shirt that usually accompanied such a face, here was a white button-down a perfectly pleated pair of khakis, and the smile his face mustard was, despite the lack of emotion behind it, as real as any waiting outside of the plywood door. In the brief moments when nothing left me, I felt just above an eddy of unsourced pain, a kind of pride. I can do this, I thought. I can do this better than anyone else here. In my saner moments, I wondered why I'd ever indulged such hubris. Here was Jay, devoted to God as a slave to his master, as a bond servant to his owner, as our addiction workbooks instructed us it should be. Here he was, telling me he'd managed an almost perfect score on his ACT, an all but free ride to any university of his choice. And what did he make of it? I know God can use this brain, he'd said one day. I just have to fix the weak parts, study more. And here was S struggling with her sexuality for so many years, and then suddenly discovered, because of one act in the midst of a lonely afternoon in her trailer, an experiment you might hear about in any pocket of high school gossip. Did you hear about that freak girl and her dog? Now trying to twist her soul around so it could fit the image of corruption her parents saw in her. And T, the man whose struggle was most evident, who took on all of our scars, Christ-like and suffered the almost daily stigma, stigmata of it while standing before our group. How could I compete? They had all been in the facility longer, knew on a day-to-day -day basis what the struggle was really like. They had gone through nothing and come out on the other side with something. Even if that something was the urge to keep struggling, keep fighting, keep denying the sin. But I wasn't so sure I would make it out of my doubt. One year of college had done exactly what my father and the church had warned me against, turned me into a skeptic, a heretic, someone who second-guessed everything he felt or saw. The more confused you feel, the closer you get to the source of childhood trauma, Smid had said earlier that morning. The source, unlike my program's name implied, I was being carried out by an undertow into shoreless waters, 
lost in this constant questioning of my past. The night before, while filling out my addiction workbook, I'd gotten so confused by the questions that I'd sneaked out of the hotel room sometime after midnight to jog a few laps around the suburban neighborhood, yellow pools of street lamp light drawing me deeper into the cold sacks, my sneakers squeaking, endorphins kicking in mid-jog so that I could concentrate long enough on my confusion to question it. Describe fully knowing others and them fully knowing you. Had I ever fully known anyone? Had anyone ever fully known me? What did that even mean? I felt like running all the way down to the ink black Mississippi and daring myself to jump in, to surrender myself to the pull. Though I wasn't suicidal like T was, I liked flirting with death, the glamour of ending it all. And so suddenly wasn't much of a leap from the end time sensationalism of our family's church. There was also pleasure to be had in knowing that the end could come at any time without warning. You might be going about your daily life thinking everything is fine when suddenly, boom, the, levee, the levees break, the waters rise, and every hateful object you know becomes treasure now belonging to a lost kingdom, artifacts for future, more enlightened excavators to ponder, life taking on greater meaning in the aftermath, all this senseless pain somehow making sense in the end. But suicide being one of the unpardonable sins, I kept to the suburban circuit, wrapped in an amber-colored vapor light. I tried praying, Lord, make me pure. But all I felt was an echo in my head. For the time being, it seemed like God had abandoned me. Like the underground man, I was trapped in stasis, in nothing. The feeling reminded me of a story I'd heard when my family vacationed near Lake Norfolk at the edge of Norfolk, at the edge of the Ozarks. A local resident told us that an entire town had been buried deep beneath the water. Depression area era farmers and their families had been required to relocate once the Norfolk Dam began construction. Schoolhouses and churches and post offices all abandoned. Bodies and old graves exhumed and relocated to higher ground. Apocryphal tales soon followed. A motorcycle buoyed up by the water, the weights of objects no longer a factor in this underwater world. Everything released from its station in life, now resting atop a steel bridge. Old town names like Henderson, Jordan, Heron, Hand, all nearly gone, eroded by water, every trace erased in the name of progress. Don't let it worry you, my mother said, catching sight of the fear in my eyes as I waded through the water beside our rented pontoon boat. I imagined steeples grazing my ankles, a literal hand from hand pulling me under. The towns are really deep, my mother spraying banana boat sun tan oil onto her freckled arms, spreading it up to her red shoulders. A creature, it seemed to me, in the moment of the land, resisting the inevitable pull of the water that would one day bury us all. This was a source of both comfort and anxiety. None of this really mattered, yet none of this really mattered. An equally terrifying idea, except, of course, when I considered what the Bible had to say about our brief lives on earth, and then all of this really mattered. Pillars of flame and sand, locusts devouring whole cities whole, Stories of Christianity were swift demolitions, leading ultimately to fulfillment. Sodom, Gomorrah. But what happened when the fulfillment never came? What happened when you never adjusted to the loss of what had once been so familiar? You can only walk on water like Peter if you don't question it. People once lifted their heads in prayer to the very spot where the balls of my feet now tread, you might think. People once believed and struggled and lived, and now that's forgotten. Once you begin to question it, you sink quickly to the bottom, unless someone like Jesus pulls you back up and chastises you for your lack of faith, your lack of vision. But where was Jesus in all the time at the facility? Where was his steady nail-scarred hand? The prayers I continued to recite each night became even more desperate and meaningless. Please help me to be pure. Please help me to be pure. Please help me to be pure. Nowhere. 
nowhere was the answer. I'd still been able to return to the hotel room an hour after my midnight run. I'd still been able to sit down at the desk without fidgeting too much and write out the answers to the addiction workbook's questions to the best of my ability. I've never fully known anyone. I only thought I knew who I was, and then the thing with David happened, and I suddenly realized that I'd been faking it the whole time. Because I didn't know myself. Because I'd been faking it. I didn't know David. This was one of the reasons why I was unable to protect myself from him. I had allowed Satan to convince me that I was a strong warrior for Christ when, in fact, I was living a sinful life. I need God's strength to become stronger, to be filled up with knowledge of who I am and who others around me truly are. I no longer knew if any of this was true, if there were any answers for what had happened, or if God even cared anymore. But even if I lacked my peers' conviction, I might still prove to be the best at public confession. Lunch. Moral inventory. Short break. All morning I stared at the pale patch of my skin on the left wrist, willing time to jump forward, waiting for the moment when my mother would come again to pick me up. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. My father had often quoted this verse in a popular sermon of his, one-tenth of a day, asking congregants to consider the brevity of their lives. Work out the math for yourselves, he preached, and you'll see that our lives are much too short. It was to this idea that I returned as nothing led me through each block of my schedule, as I prayed to nothing when the counselors asked us to bow our heads before thick slabs of casserole and thank God for the hamburger helper. If I could just think of these two weeks as a few milliseconds, once this was over, once my head felt less crowded, I might even find God waiting for me on the other side, ready to listen once again to my prayers. It's important to recognize the deficiencies in your life. Dan, Danny Cosby, one of the main staff counselors, was saying now, standing in the middle of our group, his salt and pepper hair backlit by the glare from the sliding glass door. Smid wasn't scheduled to lead any work workshops this afternoon, so Cosby was taking his place. Cosby was given a talk, once again, on the necessity of sports. Cosby was telling us that a lack of sports in childhood could lead to effeminate behavior. He told us he was just the man for the job, a recovering alcoholic who came by sports naturally. He was as straight as any man I'd ever met. He told us he used, to work, used a work ethic he learned from being a team player to pull himself out of his alcoholism, all with the help of God, of course, his life containing all the necessary raw materials to form a full recovery. He had never experienced same-sex attraction, SSA, as LIA labeled it. He'd never been through LIA's program itself, since his only major impediment in life had been alcoholism, and LIA had hired him as a counselor because they believed his extensive AA experience was the only prerequisite for curing any and all forms of addiction. He couldn't seem to understand why none of us had come by the, s the same straight impulses naturally, but he was prepared to talk us into it. He was a good, if not better, than any Carl salesman my father had ever employed, though I was skeptical of his qualifications. How could a man who never knew what it was like to live with our sin possibly know what was required to pull us out of it? Men, I'm talking to you, he said. The girls from our group have been dismissed for a separate talk on femininity. Some of you haven't had the opportunity to bond with other men of your own age. The shadow of the sliding glass door's rail fell over him like a dark sash. Some of you have idolized other men's bodies because you didn't have enough physical contact when you were younger. Maybe you thought you were bad at sports. Maybe you thought you were different. Jay was sitting across from me today. I tried to keep from looking at him each time Cosby repeated physical contact. He looked up only once, and his gaze was so cold it made me wonder if I'd only imagined that we shared a connection earlier. Even so, looking into his eyes felt intimate, the coldness he shot in my direction, an indication of something acknowledged and quickly hidden. The problem here is the powerful influence of labeling, Cosby continued. You've labeled yourself the type of person who doesn't play sports. Sadly, we grow into our labels, but we can grow out of them too. I was scared of Cosby. He 
He was a man who had dealt with drug addicts and alcoholics for most of his adult life. A man who didn't see the difference between being gay and being addicted to heroin. He'd done LSD, huffed gasoline, he'd robbed a convenience store, he'd completed all 12 steps of AA. He'd written all about it in his testimony, including a picture of himself smiling on Harley, the words, a life transformed, written in script beside him. I had no idea how to talk to him. For all of my shame and guilt, I still couldn't see myself as equal to a drug addict, a bank robber. My father always said you could tell the character of a man by how he treated low people. So a man who refused to talk to someone lower than himself wasn't worth a cent. But I still thought I was better than all of that. And I worried that Cosby would instantly see through to my hypocrisy. I thought he might already be able to tell that I had stopped really praying to God. It's important to get in touch with this part of yourselves, Cosby said, this masculine part that's been missing for so long. The blonde haired greeter entered the room from the back wheeling in a television on a portable stand. I grown to hate this boy's self-satisfied smile. The same smile I saw every morning as he rummaged through my belongings in search of FIs. It was a smile that seemed to say, I have lived through this, and what you're experiencing is only a small fraction of what I've experienced. His smile said, it only gets worse. But without any of the pity I saw in Smith's face, the boy was too recent a graduate. His ex-gay status only recently conferred, and he seemed to have singled me out, to have detected me in some stubbornness he'd already put behind himself, some dogged rationalization that didn't belong in a place like LIA. I hope you're here for the right reasons, he'd said earlier that morning, his fingers slipping into the folds of my wallet, because if not, it was strange. As I watched him wheel the television to the spot beside Cosby, I felt a sudden pang of disappointment, and I realized with a start that I missed Smid. At least Smid had been patient with me. At least Smid had looked disgusted at the sight of me. Cosby and the blonde-haired boy shared an expression between them that reminded me of all the judgmental looks I'd gotten from friends and acquaintances the minute they found out through David's gossip that I was gay. It was the stay away from my child look, the you're a pervert, you're a monster, you've got the wrong plumbing look. All those perverts, my next door neighbor said one weekend just after my parents had found out, this little white-haired lady smacking her lips in a way that made me think she'd somehow not heard about me. She'd been watching a debate on Fox News about gay marriage, had caught me as I was walking next to her yard. They need to get their heads checked, putting things in places where they don't belong, plumbing the wrong pipes if you know what I mean. I half expected Cosby to start in on the metaphors. Bad wiring, wrong gears, loose screws. We'll be watching a documentary this afternoon, Cosby said, pressing the power button at the bottom of the television. A high-pitched electronic wheeze spread across the room, then faded into the background, joining the buzzing of the fluorescence. I no longer remember exactly what the movie was about, aside from sports, but I do remember his look of satisfaction on Cosby's face as he stood to the side of our group with his hands crossed over his chest. I almost envied him for his drug habit, for the masculine nature of his affliction. If he had roughhoused with men in bars, gotten in fights, he didn't need this documentary to be straight. He just was. His straightness buzzed off him, inhabited the room. He was like an exotic animal in the midst of us, an instinctual being, with none of the self-consciousness the rest of us felt. When he didn't look disgusted with us, he looked amused, as though he couldn't possibly imagine what it must have been like to be in such a painfully distorted mind. I had been wondering what it felt like to be in a straight mind my whole life, or at least ever since I discovered I was gay, when, in third grade, I realized that my interest in our teacher, Mr. Smith, was much greater than that of my other male peers. Though, over the years, I'd done my best to pretend otherwise, I'd had a string of male crushes that wouldn't go away, a constant guilty ache that ran through my body for so long that I came to believe that feeling was just a part of what was it was meant to be to be alive. The only moments when the ache became a sharp pain were when I allowed myself to imagine a happy life with these crushes, a rarity to be sure. As Cosby spoke, I wondered what it felt like to see yourself reflected in every movie, to have friends and family constantly dropping fun little hints about your love life and to have the world open up to you in all its magnificence. What did it feel like not to have 
to think about your every move, to not be scrutinized for everything you did, to not have to lie every day. In most of my stubborn moments, the moments that must have accumulated to such a degree that the blonde-haired boy distrusted me, I told myself that it must have felt really dull to be straight. When I was my most stubborn self, I thought, this affliction is what makes me smarter. This disadvantage is what gives me my ambition. This is what first inspired me to write. But the handbook was clear on this subject, on the attribute of superiority that all gay people expressed, what basically amounted to an intricate ruse designed to hide their true inferiority. When their manipulation fails, they become deeply depressed and their self-worth plummets. Often their value is connected to their ability to control others. True enough, I thought after reading this, it was clear to anyone around me that I was completely lost, that I wasn't in control, and that my self-worth was at an all-time low. After all, it was not hard to think that I was destroying my family, that its legacy would end with me a dead end. Worse, it was hard not to think about all the money my parents were spending, the 1500 they had paid for only two weeks of therapy. Hardest of all was the thought of standing beside my father the next day during the ordination ceremony and lying to the 200 plus people who would gather to celebrate his calling, beaming my fake smile to the crowd. But was it wrong to think that I could be better than this blonde haired boy? Was it wrong to think that God would return to me, listen to my prayers once again, if only I worked harder? And even as I watched the documentary, smiling each time I caught the flash of pale flesh, the sudden motion of a player pilling, pilling on top of its opposing mate's ass and taking the man down with the sloppy precision of the precision of the defensive tackle, was it wrong to think that I could play the game better than all of them? The Living Word Lutheran Church was a conspicuous cluster of three A-frames surging out of this small suburban neighborhood with a string of narrow windows pinched at origami angles at each side, a sharp lotus flower of glass and concrete that seemed at least partially inspired by the 1960s brutalism of old public libraries and post offices. As we approached our small group of source teens packed together in LIA's van, all of us turned to face its facade. The church inside is gorgeous, a boy behind me said. The adjective slipped into his sentence without pretense. Did certain words constitute FIs? We have to see the sanctuary. Certain intonations? During the last break, an ex-lesbian had come up to me and tsk tsk at my akimbo stance. I had been standing near the doorway with one hand on the wall and the other on a hip. I'm not going to report you, she said, as if I was supposed to be grateful to thank her in some way, but you really need to change that FI before someone else sees you. We pulled into the asphalt lot, yellow lines wishing by, slowing. Cosby slid open the side door and ushered us outside. Steep triangles overhead, the glare of windows, complicated geometry I hardly understood. Less than a year later, this building would become LIA's new headquarters, a cleaner, loftier space where the long line of windows would bathe patients in a holier light. For now, however, LIA merely rented out a few rooms from the church for occasional afternoon activities the strip mall facility too small to accommodate both older and younger patients at once. It was important to keep afternoon activities separate, primarily because patients attended LIA for very different reasons. The source and refuge, program, refuge programs, both youth groups, most of us under the age of 20, shared our afternoon classes together. And since most of us were dealing with homosexuality, it made sense that we'd have similar stories to share during our activities. You can have a short break, Cosby said, leading us inside. A quick look around if you want, and then we'll meet up in the hallway. Several of us entered the sanctuary. It was quiet inside, the carpet absorbing the sound of our steps. Sun-drenched wooden aisles, all with little crocheted tissue boxes nestled on the ends, about 30 rows, three sections facing the pulpit. I could feel something dark looming somewhere beside, behind me, and I turned sharply, to face a low balcony, impressive to me because I had never attended a church with a balcony. I imagined having to walk down the aisle in such a place, all of those aisles, those eyes looking down on you from above. 
During my baptism, all the staring had come from one direction, and I'd been able to look above the congregants' heads to the blank white spaces at the back of the church, devote myself to God as much as I could in such a public moment. But in here, it seemed like you, you'd never be alone with God. Here, it seemed like you would always be under the spell of someone's watchful gaze. I walked up the aisle, my feet treading softly on the carpet. How many times had I seen my father do the same? How many times had I seen his face wet with tears, shaking all the way to the altar? It was strange to think of the picture I made now, walking ahead of the group, my face placid, free of emotion. The walking dead, I thought, squaring my shoulders. I didn't feel. I wouldn't feel. I wouldn't let them see me feel. I wouldn't be weak like my father. I wouldn't give that ex-lesbian another chance to correct me. By the end of my stay here, I would be the one correcting her. I was stronger than all of this, and I would prove it no matter the consequences, no matter how much feeling I had to sacrifice in the process. The windows ahead were impressively unstained, as if the architect had made the bold decision to leave the beauty of the sanctuary up to nature, to God. No stains, no fragmented depictions of biblical scenes, no sharp colored light. Sometimes it was what you left unsaid or undone that drew you into a state of wonder. And as nothing drew me closer to the altar, as I mounted the stage and looked out at all the empty aisles, imagining the crowd I'd have to face during my father's ceremony the next day, I wondered if this was what God was doing. I wondered if God was letting me go for a short time, cutting the connections so that I could grow stronger and straighter by myself. Though I worried that God might choose to stop visiting me altogether, that I might have damaged our relationship beyond repair, I also knew that there was no going back. I was committed to becoming stronger, though I had no idea what that really meant. Could I even become entirely straight? And even if I could, would that mean that my relationship with God would be the same? Or did the process of becoming stronger entail losing my previous way of life? Whatever form that strength was going to take, I would have to accept it. I would face tomorrow's crowd with the stone-cold glare I had seen in Jay's eyes today. The glare of a martyr. Even if that was the furthest thing from what I truly felt myself to be. Focus on your feelings, Cosby said. I really want you to focus. When we were in the one of the church's class we were in one of the church's classrooms the light different here darker with only one window looking out onto the parking lot cosby was at the front of the classroom looking like a high school coach who also doubled as a math teacher brow furrowed as if thinking of something else the next day's game the next equation i'd like you to turn to the general tools section of your handbook the fluttering of paper lift fingers I found the page, five columns and six rows of cartoon faces, each face with a label beneath it. Contented, depressed, frazzled, frightened, happy, thoughtless, starry-eyed, disgusted, shocked, enraged. All of the faces a simple, simplistic rendering of each emotion. I want you to think about how you feel right now, Cosby said. It can be a combination of several faces. Choose carefully. On the table at the front of the classroom were several white posters. Next to them were colored markers and pencils. There were also feathers, beads, and multicolored string. Various crafts a middle schooler might keep in a caboodle. Cosby explained that we were to craft masks symbolizing the two halves of our personality, the one we show to the outside world and the one we show only to ourselves. One mask on one side, the other on the back. I slid my finger down the page trying to find a word for what I felt. Dead inside, but weirdly determined? Apprehensive came the closest. Or perhaps out of sorts. I followed the others to the table at the front of the classroom, picked up a poster, and found some markers and a few cotton balls. When I sat down to my work to work on my project, Jay sat next to me. We both got on our knees. I smoothed my poster out on the seat cushion. Could you pass me the red? Jay said, coldness in his voice. Red, I thought color of passion. I would soon watch that passion turn into drops of blood on his poster. Jesus' blood. Not passion, but sacrifice. I looked around for ideas. S began gluing cotton to her poster, making some kind of pale smiley face. 
I watched her for a long time before turning away to work on my own poster. She was creating clouds painted dark blue, rain clouds, the bright orange silver of sun barely visible with no signs of fur or peanut butter. I was happy for her. Looking good so far, Cosby said, walking past me, head bent, reverential. He sounded like he meant it. He sounded like the kind of person who had done this activity many times, learned how to forge only one face from his divided selves. I uncapped a blue marker and scribbled a series of lines, then turned those lines into the outlines of waves, connected them with the cotton balls so that the tops of the waves looked as though they were cresting. A violent whirlpool, a great swirling with no direction. On the other side, the long forgotten eroded city beneath. Forty-five minutes. All right, we can get a few more pages in. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, this chapter is called "Prisoners Cinema." My father and I barely talked on our ride to the jail. It had been a month since my parents discovered I was gay, and now it was almost Thanksgiving break, the week I would spend mostly at home, feeling there was very little to be thankful for. I sat beside my father in the passenger seat of his red F-150 Lariat, watching the trees advance and retreat along the edge of the snaking road, the mountains folding around us, leading us to, into the center of what a state governor had declared would one day be call, become the Mecca of the Ozarks. I closed my eyes, but the afterimage remained. Pine-studded peaks, browning pine needles, the morning sun hanging like a heat lamp over it all. My family had made the pilgrimage to this town in 1999, just after we lost our cotton gin to a corporate competitor, long after the town had already transformed itself into a place for retired Chicagoans and Southern fundamentalists to buy cheap property where it was safe to keep and bear arms and brag about it. In the five years since we moved, our, my parents had learned how to fit in with some of the Northerners, talk with a slight nasal accent, smile less, People came here to change their lives for the better, to live at a different pace, though later I learned that a change of scenery would never change someone like me, that no amount of camouflage could hide the same sex fantasies I had been having since seventh grade. Are you ready? My father said, his eyes flickering from the road to the nervous hands I kept wringing in my lap. I'm ready, I said, my fingers freezing into a steeple. I remembered a rhyme my teachers taught me in a vacation Bible school class. Here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the people. It'll be a different kind of education than you're used to, my father said. Your college professors won't teach you this. Much of my father's work now involved educating people outside of the church's doors. His increased ambition had led him to witness to an ever-increasing number of customers at his dealership to walk the neighborhood streets behind our house to knock on doors in search of lost souls, and now his greatest mission to witness to the forgotten downtrodden the inmates of the local county jail. This was my first time shadowing him on one of his early Saturday morning visits. Visits. I had never vi before visited the jail, though he had come many times before, and I was still half asleep, unaccustomed to the new schedule my parents had proposed after David outed me, which required me to drive back from college Friday afternoons and wake up early Saturday mornings to spend more time with my family. After several minutes of silence, my father pressed the button for the radio. His Credence Clearwater Revival CD replaced our silence with the nostalgic and happy light notes of a Louisiana bayou none of the band members had ever truly experienced. To anyone passing us on the road, we must have looked happy. Off to see some roadside attraction. I closed my eyes again, pressed my heels of the heels of my palms against my eyelids until the afterimages grew fractions and broke apart, an ice shelf descending into black arctic water. The images of what had happened the night of my rape stayed with me also, working their way into nearly every minute of my waking life. The blurry image of the younger boy David told me he'd raped, the sight of David towering over me, forcing my head down. One second I felt calm, the next, I would recall some forgotten pocket of memory, and, and an uncontrollable rage would grip me. 
rage directed toward me and everyone around me, a desire to destroy everything I saw. After David called and outed me to my parents, my mother had driven me home from college, speeding through yellow lights to arrive at our house in record time. As she vomited in the adjacent bedroom, bathroom, my father led me into his bedroom, the door clicking shut behind him, and explained that what I was feeling was wrong, that I was simply confused. You don't know what it feels like to be with a woman, he'd said. There's nothing else in the world like the pleasure between a man and his wife. I didn't know what to say. I traced the pattern of the comforter with my index finger, following and stitching along the yellow-brown bulb of a jonquil. If I could just keep moving my hands. My religious studies professor had noticed my restless hands one day in class, inviting me into his office to teach me some of his meditation techniques. Left hand, palm down. Turn left palm up. Do not say to yourself, turn the left hand. Awareness is all. Though I'd experienced little success with these techniques, having something to do with my hands seemed better than giving in to the trembling. It's so warm, so natural, my father said, being with a woman. I felt the sudden urge to join my mother in front of our toilet, our disgust perhaps uniting us for a moment, though for different reasons. None of us had wanted to know about each other's sex lives, yet here we were. When my mother returned to the room, wiping her mouth with the back of her hand, my parents sat me down on the edge of the bed and explained that they would find a way to cure me. They would talk to our preacher, see what options were available. There were ways, they said. They'd once heard a visiting preacher give a speech about counseling options. In the meantime, I would spend my weekends at home, two hours away from the sinful college-educated influences that have led me to this point. Sitting there with my sneakers hovering above the carpet like a little kid, tracing my fingers along the comforter while watching my mother continue to smear pink lipstick on the back of her hand, I couldn't find the nerve to tell them what my friend had done. David had trumped me. The knowledge of my homosexuality would seem more shocking than the knowledge of my rape. Or, worse, it would seem as though one act had inevitably followed the other, as though I had had it come into me. Either way, our family's shame would remain the same. You'll never step foot in this house again if you act on your feelings. My father said, you'll never get an education. That night, I made the quietest decision to agree to whatever they had in mind. The shame and rage settling in my chest, filling up spaces I had previously reserved for love, spreading beneath my skin like invisible bruises. Unlike my mother, I had no way of purging myself, no way of staring into my watery reflection, of obliterating my features with sick. Instead, I could only cut my hands in prayer and make a promise to God that I would try harder, the carpet burning its twin pointillus patterns into my kneecaps. I could only stand before my bathroom mirror and rub the sharp edge of a pair of scissors against my Adam's apple back and forth until the blade began to leave faint marks that would prove difficult to explain. I could only be like the sinful Narcissus I'd read about in Edith Hamilton's mythology, which was nestled in my backpack, too in love with the image of myself reflected in other men's bodies, too haunted by what I saw to turn away. To prevent myself from drowning, I agreed to my parents' plan. As the weeks passed and the next steps solidified, we would decide if I was to stay in college or if more drastic steps needed to be taken. Each night, the images arrived fully formed, as if by clockwork. David and the boy, David towering over me. My li father's lips moving as though independent of the sounds he was making, the look of fear that split the skin of my parents' faces into fractals with increasingly smaller worry lines. I had chosen to accompany my father to his jail ministry as a way of ending these images, as an alternative to the suicide I contemplated almost nightly, to the scissors I began to feel for in the middle of the night, running my restless hands along the lip between my mattress and box spring until reaching those twin metal tongues. Perhaps I had known how close I truly was to suicide. I would, or had I known how tr truly close I was to suicide, 
I would have kept away from the jail and its dank cells, its display of lives broken by bad choices and bad luck, of people who had been unable to change themselves when it most counted. Yet, it's also possible that what I truly craved was the knowledge of how my father accomplished the impossible, how he reformed these men, gave them hope, brought them back to their best selves before God. No sin is too great to be forgiven. My father would often say, paraphrasing Exodus, maybe that could apply to me too. And we will stop there. This was a heavy, heavy section. So, you know, take some time for some light things and take care. I'll see you next time. Bye.